the quality uh, any better for your music snob? Is it not, not, as, not for a music snob, no. But actually, I'm a CD, CD fan. And I love vinyl, but I'm actually sorry that CDs will go away because I think the quality is so much better. So. This Bandcamp, I just went on Bandcamp site, and it looks like they have they you can purchase the three different things so you can get higher quality. Yep. yep. But that's, I mean, that's assuming you're going to download it, burn it to a CD, and then play it on a stereo, which okay. I don't think most people are doing. So just a regular download it and still play the stuff. It'll still sound as crappy on a computer laptop <laughs> speaker as it does now, yes. They're paying, uh, these services are, are paying license fees to the artists and they're also paying mechanics to publishers. Sorry. Yeah, I don't know about the cameras, honestly. I don't. Um, I know that we get money from Sound Exchange um, for those kinds of services, but I don't know about the cameras. In other words, they're, they're, they're monetizing this for the artists, but is, is it going into the correct funnels? The well, Sound Exchange is the organization that collects for these. Yeah, I, and I know, I mean, I know we're getting pretty sizable checks. I, it's, I don't know, honestly, don't know how mechanicals work when there's not a physical project. I mean, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, et cetera, they're all, I mean, they're all connected to these, these firms. No, those are for broadcasts. Those wouldn't be. They don't track. This would be Sound Exchange, and there's another one. What's the other one? Um, well, it's digit. It's, it's is it BDS or and Play Networks? They're I actually networks. just got a notice of intent to license from Ardia. So it went to, there were three publishing companies involved, so it went through, it's going through our publishing company. Okay. Yeah. Now I don't know the other part, like I thought BMI would kind of work out that part, because apparently I have to send a W-9, mm -hmm. but I thought, I still have yet to call BMI and ask them like, what's the deal, like shouldn't this just go through you, but you know, at some point when it starts to sell, you're supposed to send a W-9 Yes. Yeah, I did get, um, when you were mentioning the website, Mog and, and audio, do you want to know what you mentioned? Groove Shark? Yeah, you saw it from the Groove, G-R-O-O-V-E. Sorry, it's my New York, come Boston accent. Um, shark, S-H-R-K. It sounds a lot like Providence. I was just at I was at the Asia Festival in Rhode Island, and everybody from New Orleans and Providence were there, and it sounded like I was in Brooklyn. Um, so we were going to talk about. Talk, talk, about talk about email. Yes. Um, Let's talk about email. I, I just want to say that email, all of this stuff is great, but the, the backup of my band's email list exists in a safe deposit box with my will and the key to my house. It is the most important thing that we have. Um, relative to a lot to, to a lot of work that's going on, our list is small, six thousand. But every time, and it, it, it's been 10 years in the making, every time he puts out a new uh, piece of music, I sell 2,000 to 2,500 pieces of that via that list, which is an enormous return for an email list. Um, the list uh, is very simple. We send out text-based emails. We seldom do it more than once a week. We don't do it at all when we're in kind of quiet periods. I should say, I work with an artist who is extremely talented, but not terribly prolific, and also doesn't like to tour at all. So um, so I don't have a lot to work with. But um, okay. when uh, when he does put out the records, we, we send things out once a week. The, the newsletters, um, if they're not written by him, which is a very special treat, he's actually a published novelist, and he's a very good writer. Um, I write them, but they're not just the new records out, buy it, he's going to do a couple of dates. They're very, um, they're kind of essays um, in and of themselves. And, they and they're hysterical. <laughs> so if you haven't subscribed to her newsletter, <laughs> go to dashmontmedia.com. But it's a simple um, text-based, I, I, someone asked the question about using um, email services. I use a simple text-based um, newsletter. I, I put out a simple text-based newsletter using a mailman list from bear.com. Um, knowing that some of the people who receive our emails are not terribly um, tech savvy, and um, they have lots of calls in them, lots of links and things like that, um, you know, being very careful to use short links or links that won't get caught as spam. But a very, very simple text-based <coughs> newsletter is, is, um, has been extremely important it's, uh, to us. It's uh, getting, getting an email with all sorts of HTML artifacts in it. Yeah, yeah, we don't we don't do that. Um, constant contact I, I did use for a while, and I used it um, pretty regularly in my other work, which is basically sending out press releases to Boston media. And I found that the Boston Globe, which is our largest daily, has three different servers that they use for email, 
and one of them was catching anything that came through constant contact and calling it spam. So that's problematic for me because the arts editor at the Globe was not receiving the press releases that I was sending out. Um, until they can fix that and tell me that it's fixed, actually even after they tell me that it's fixed, I probably won't go back there. But that's a huge problem if, if those are being caught in spam. Mailman lists are not going to do that. Sending out a regular email with, a, you know, with some of your name in the to field and a BCC for everybody else, not a good idea, because those are very likely to get caught in spam too if there are too many BCCs in the in field. <laughs> and, and, don't, and don't put your list in the two or CC fields so that everybody else can see it. It's just sort of bad email form. And once you, someone's email is out there, they're going to they're gonna get bombarded with spammers too. So, right. so you're trying to avoid spam filters. So, so that's what I use for the Pernice Brothers email list for sending out press releases, which might be relevant to some of you. Um, I've tried everything. Everything. They're trying to simplify it. Um, I'm generally sending out, say, for instance, 300 press releases at a time. Um, and I like to include personal notes in the press releases a lot of times, which tend to get, tends to get me more coverage for whatever event it is I'm working on. Um, so I use a simple mail merge program using Outlook, and I actually have to hit the send button 300 times, which is worth it for me because I can include that personal note to each individual press person. Um, and I found that that's been extremely effective. So email is the most important thing. Of all the things we're talking about, most important. Facebook is great. I'm a complete Twitter addict. But, um, but the email list is, the, is definitely the thing that you want to concentrate on. And to keep gathering those names, when you have an artist like mine who doesn't like to tour, so there's no book at the merch table saying sign up for our email list, um, we do things like have contests where well, we recently, well, this actually has a little bit of a backstory, but um, uh, Joe Pernice is obnoxious and says very obnoxious things to me. <laughs> he's not really, but he, he play, he's kind of this curmudgeonly guy. And um, he says very obnoxious things to me all the time. And then a couple of years ago, I just started tweeting these things. And it became this series called Pernice to Me that got this very large following of people, um, which then turned into a book which then turned into a puppet show. And now there are puppets <laughs> of us um, talking to each other, being extremely obnoxious, that are on the, on the internet and, you know, and our fans are, are following them. Um, the contest that we recently had was that we awarded to one winner, um, we, we made a puppet of them, and we are in the process of filming a concert which is going to be the Pernice Brothers puppets playing a concert with the puppet in attendance because the joke is the band never tours, so the puppet's going to get to see the show and nobody else is. <laughs> and, then, and then that person will get their puppet. So that's a, that's a pretty nice item. We have, we're having a puppet made of this one person. So we got 3,000 entries um, off from, from that contest. And of those 3,000, about uh, 1,400 were email addresses we didn't already have. Whether they are second email addresses from people who really wanted to enter more than once, I have no idea. But um, they definitely added to the email list. So that's um, something that you want to be thinking about is how to um, grow your email list. It's extremely important. And I have a very, very low unsubscribe rate, which is something that everybody should be striving for. So now these are, this is him in Canada? What? Producing the video? Uh, yeah. What are you? No, no, he doesn't. Oh, yeah, no, this is his retaliation. <laughs> this is his retaliation. <laughs> So um, he makes me look like an ass, he makes himself look really, really good. But the fans really like it. So, um, and, and because he's doing these once a week, that's yet another thing that I can send out via the email list or via Twitter or via Facebook or anything else. And there are people who are actually watching this stuff who weren't fans of the band before, the, before this stuff started happening. So this is what you would call content, which I will come to hate that word. But it's the idea that the web is more about frequency than it is about you know, volume all at once that you have something on a regular basis to push out there. So I mean, that's a great, great example of creating new content that you can keep servicing and, and sharing with people. What was the service, or was it software called Mailman? Mailman, I'm actually not sure. I mean, I use that to pair.com, which is my um, uh, host, internet host. Um, but I think Mailman is something that most of those um, companies use. What, a, what other email? Uh, Who's using what? Who's service using providers are people using? I use Mail List King, which you run locally on your machine. And does it look like a mail merge, basically? Where it's addressed to one person? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and you haven't had any problems with it? There used to be one called aweather.com, which you pay for, like constant, con uh, like constant contact, but that one gets caught a lot in spam filters. Yeah. yeah. That's, so a big, that's, that's a big why problem. Mailman's probably a better one. Right. And I like the <coughs> Mailman dedukes things automatically when new addresses are put in. Um, and it shows you what's bouncing if you have bad addresses. So it's, it's, and it's very easy to use. I, I shouldn't knock constant contact because they are Boston 
sort of face. Yeah, but I spend a lot of time on the phone with them, and I'm gonna knock them. <laughs> <laughs> their their interface actually is very time consuming, and to go in and edit each block is is like a whole day, which it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I've been using Mailchimp.com, which is a much more Web 2.0 version, but the problem is it doesn't tell me who who actually opened the email, whereas constant contact theoretically, Those aren't real. but Those it's aren't. but it's not really real. So it, that, that's to me is like. That would be the brass ring if somebody could tell you who actually opened the email. Right. But no one's really. But with my list, I know who opened the email because I know who ordered the CD and I know who's yeah. writing to me. And we have a very personal engagement with these people. And I will say also that Joe has me. Some of, I know some of you people are actually the artist who's interacting with the, the customer. And sometimes that's an uncomfortable thing. Um, I understand it because I'm kind of a marketer who has a certain amount of disdain for marketing. So, uh, and I understand that if you're the one who's actually selling your own stuff, that can be a little bit problematic. But just try to be. Um, you know, very kind of authentic about what you're doing, and I think people will respond. I think he was. Uh, is that what you were going to say, Belchamp? I was going to say campaign monitor. What is it? Campaign, campaign monitor? monitor? Okay. That's sort of an old school one, but they're really, really smart. Cool. I hadn't seen that before. Um, I heard someone speak, an artist speak, that they had, and I'm trying to figure out how, they, how this is possible. <laughs> That they had a thing where you could text into their, send a text from the show, mm -hmm. and it went into their database, it went oh. into their email list. Yeah. How does that kind of thing happen? President Obama used that very successfully in the last election. It's a yeah. paid service. There's a bunch of services that do mobile, that handle mobile stuff. The problem with them so far that I've seen is they're really expensive to get set up, and then even the ones, the one that Phoenix uses, yeah. it was like $1,000 a month for the account. I was like, you know, it was crazy. So nobody, I, I haven't seen maybe somebody was getting there, but bringing the pricing down, so if it's like $20 a month or $10 a month would be doable. But the idea of you could text and capture someone's information on site, um, if you have the money, you can do any of that stuff, but it's it's not cost effective yet. You might find some information about it on the Boston Phoenix's website because I know if, if, if you look under advertising, that's one of the products that they offer. I'm not sure if that's pricing, but I'll have some information. Okay, then also in that same vein, if if um, when somebody comes to your web your own site and they type in, and if you use uh, you have my website post and then you have your data management, is there a way that goes directly into your your, your you can make it go into a Google Doc. That's really simple. Yep. That you or you could do it as a sign up with Constant Contact. I think Mailchimp does the same. Usually they'll have a, a bit of code that you can add to your site and then it will just say, enter me in your email list. A lot of people use um, uh, FeedBurner, which is Google's sorry, what is it? FeedBurner. Yeah, feed I know. It's the language wall is not as ridiculous. Uh, FeedBurner what, is an RSS. Feeder feed system that Google bought, and well, it's the one I've used since the beginning for my podcast as an RSS feed. But it's for you know, blogs basically are built on that RSS feed. If, when there's a new update, if somebody's subscribing to you as an RSS feed, they get it in their their feed reader. And on the um, email list, there's a lot of uh, sites that you're seeing that you can enter it in as an email address, and then when the blog updates, it automatically sends out an update. Um, Hypebot, which is the music news, uh, e-newsletter and website, which is great. Um, they use that as their their email management tool, which I think is really smart because it cuts out a step. And the emails show up; they're not, they're very text based. They're not beautiful HTML affairs, but who cares? You know. Um, I just want to kind of go back to topspin. <laughs> um, I you love Topspin. Are you from Topspin? <laughs> Are you from Topspin? I'm not. No, I'm not from Topspin <laughs> Um, But I can say that I've been helping a lot of artists, and honestly, it's it's got the email. You know, it has the email too. And every time somebody buys something, you get their email. Right. But on top of that, you get to see everything they've done, everything they've purchased. You get to see it. Oh, really. They interact in the promotion if you put up a free CD, you know, a free download. Right. They'll have a key for promo and dollar sign and fee if they signed up to opt in for email. So you can do, so you can yeah, gather. Yeah. Have, they, have they brought their pricing down? Because when it first started, it was sort of out of reach, I think, of most. Well, it's like $200 like maybe, a year. Yeah, yeah. I think Topspin is still a little bit Well, pricey. they take a percentage of your sales. Oh, okay. okay. So, um, as does in a bit. Um, Topspin doesn't have a 
There's pros and cons to both of these. I'm not saying either of them have built the perfect sure. house trap. However, there's no doubt in this conversation that's occurring and all of the um, confusion that people are having over how to integrate all of their stuff, they, they are the best at doing this. They yeah. have email databases. You send a newsletter from them and you get to see how many people click on here. And, and if you put links in your email, you get to see who clicked on what links and right. blah, blah. And if it worked. And, the, and then it's got some pretty big names that are using it at the moment. They're getting more and more people who are formerly on a record it's label. It's getting better. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I have to say, they provide the email widget for you to on your website. So you can do a free download for email. Uh, so they, they both do the same thing. Some things they each yeah. do better than the other. On, on that point, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think CD Baby is the only um, electronic distributor that will give you the email address of the person they, who buys. They do. And, they, and not all of the, not like I know Iona. Know, uh, both Tosted and Nibbit. and Nibbit, but in terms of C, oh, uh, electronic distribution, yeah. I'm pretty sure CD Baby is the only one that they does that, which is a big deal. Because yeah, I'm trying to decipher. I, in case anything happens to any of these sites, I have to own my email. That's so right. I, where I get confused is when I go through all the, you know, I'm looking at all the different Oxfins, Reverb Nation, TuneCore, Nimbit, how they all work together, and also I want to hold on to my, my email list. Do, do they do that? Do they yes. not? Do they send it in it's a different way? It's I'd love to be able to have it come Can you just down, download it or yeah, export it? You can export it to an Excel spreadsheet or, and save it to a, you know, a disk so, and put it in your so you deposit box <laughs> with your will. But, so, but if you send out a newsletter via Topspin and then you send it out to the list that you keep in your own um, server, are you running the risk of the same person getting the same email twice? Yeah, yeah. so That's you just integrate them. Right. Right. You, I just integrate. Any artists I work with when they go on the services, we just take all of their emails from wherever they are somewhere else and put them into the you can import emails you already have into both of the So you basically have to de dupe every time you do a newsletter? No, they do that. If I go to Right, with you but against your own list. That yeah. doesn't exist in top or Well, they just use that list. They don't have none of this anymore. Mm -hmm. That is their list. Or and how often do you get it from them? Just whenever you request yeah, it? You, you can go in and print it up and export it out and it's a spreadsheet. And, um, I think that those things are helpful if you're, if you're at a certain sales level. I know I mean, we still do our own, I, I still do our own fulfillment. We do our fulfillment yeah, myself. Well, <coughs> we do right. So Who does it? Topspin doesn't do no, physical, no. but Nibbit does, I think. They said that. Yeah, you don't have to do this. Right, right. Because you'll see who bought it, and then you just get the email and you can fill it. Right. And they think you're not part of the sale, so. Yeah, and, and in talking to the, the number of musicians that I talk to, I think a lot of people want to assume like write off CDs and, and just do vinyl or do this, do that. I actually think we're, we're exactly where it was 20, 30 years ago, where you made vinyl, you made CD, uh, tape, cassette tape, you made an A-track. I mean, it's the same thing, that different people want different mediums, so sometimes, I, a lot of people in the music world will just be like, the CD's done, you know, da, da, da. and it's like, you know what, you have to service different audiences, and not everybody, I mean, I have a record player, but it doesn't work half the time, so I don't want to go back to vinyl, and I hate MP3s, but, you know, you have to make it available. I was just going to point out, that this is on Mac, and I don't know, there's probably equivalent versions on PC, but there's a pro program called Max Vault Mailer, that is super cheap, it's like $15 or something, it's a desktop application that is, if you're a Mac user, it's very easy to use, and you basically it can do an email campaign that's either text or HTML, but I always do text only, and you can set it up so that it's personalized with a person's name, not with a certain field you can plug in, so it's like a mail merge and then it shoots out the note, and it actually will send out the emails one at a time, because what you're trying to avoid is getting stuff caught by spam filters by uh, like three or four different places along the curve. So it might get caught by your, your ISP <coughs> or someone in the middle or your recipients. So setting them out one at a time, which is what Joyce is doing manually, but 
there are other options to do this. And um, I was actually working at WGBH before Arts Boston, and the entire PR department was sitting there sending out emails one at a time. And this was like 2004, and I was like, are you guys kidding me? <laughs> like, this entire group, because they didn't want anything to get caught by spam filters, and they were worried about getting blacklisted. But in truth, there are tools out there to sort of help to facilitate this stuff, but it's all time consuming when you're sort of building the list itself. So, um, two points for the slate down here. I think you asked two questions. Um, with a mobile application trying to get SMS, mm -hmm. this isn't a solution, but there's a company called Twilio. It's getting really popular. It's T W I L I O. Um, and it's just a platform that lets developers build voicemail and SMS applications. Oh, really? yeah. There isn't a solution for a music artist yet that that's going to be like point to power the solution to give you an affordable solution to that problem. That's so great. just check it out, you know, search really up now and then you might see something come up that's music related. Um, you second, said T T W I L I F? Exactly. Yeah, so that's great. Because yeah. Easily. I mean obviously mobile is huge and you do want to try and capture people's information as best you can. Um, the company that the company that um, is worth looking at is Gateway, which is up in Boston, and they do these huge mobile campaigns for like Metallica <coughs> and artists of that size. And what they try and do is just gather uh, you know huge volumes of text and, and, and SMS info, and then they're sending out either um, exclusive offers or advance notices on ticket sales, things like that. Uh, I'm always a big advocate of like looking at what the really big music folks are doing out there and trying to figure out how do you emulate that at a smaller local level. Um, the people that I think are brilliant online are uh, Madonna's website and what she's doing with her, her fan and, and membership and U2 are, are both just, they, they're, even though they've still got record deals and run record labels, they're, they like totally get how to use the web, um, along with Prince who doesn't have a website at all at the moment, which I love. Um, <laughs> But you know, trying to look at what people are doing out there and saying, okay, that's a really interesting idea. I don't really have the team of people to execute this, but how do I take some piece of that idea and do it? And uh, the mobile piece is huge because everyone that shows up at a show or that you see at a venue or a store, they all have their phone. You know, it's such a, it's an easy way to capture it. Sorry, I have one more point for her. Sorry. Second question: um, data, email, is it yours? If it's on one of these systems. How do you get it if you need it at some point? Just one, read the terms of service, make sure your email is your property when you put it into one of the services. And don't think of it as just email. Worry about your images and photos and videos. Anything that you put on a third party website that you might want, if you leave that third party website, just read the terms. And B, make sure it has an API. The import and export, that's like that's like the 1990s. Now you want an API so this all happens dynamically. Because whenever an API. an API is an application programming interface, so the idea is that if your data exists on one of these third-party websites, it can be programmably put into another website if you need it to. That means every time you get an order, it would automatically be put in your email list somewhere else. Say you're running your email list outside of Topspin or something, and you want to push it there. That should happen automatically. It shouldn't force you to waste any time you know, exporting and exporting things. So. Terms of service, make sure the content is yours, and the API will let you get that at any point, programmably, not manually, basically. Well, it actually raises an interesting point, because I think what a lot of people have tried to do over the last few years with social media is, how do you turn it into something that I can just do five minutes a day and I can go back to my other stuff? And I mentioned at the beginning, um, there's a, a guy in, in Boston that works at an agency, and he has a site called Sc Scalable Intimacy, and I've seen his presentation, and it's basically, you know, how do you have your persona, and then figure out these couple of spots online that you're gonna push out your content, and you know, every day or every other day, you go about and do that, and somebody else in Boston I saw responded to it and said, that sounds nice, but the reality is that all of this stuff is about a conversation, and it's not about, I push my stuff out to you, and you run up and buy it, and then we're all done. You know, it's just, that's not the way it works. A lot of it is about this conversation back and forth, and it's constant. 
you know, unless you just close the computer and walk away from it. So unless I think. Unless you're a fucking rock star. Unless you're a fucking rock star. Unless, unless you're Amanda Palmer. I mean, and Amanda Palmer, who you know is the buzzword of the moment for managing her career. She has like three or four people who are helping her to do all this stuff. She is. She is. I mean, I interviewed her, and the minute we were done, she was on Tumblr and she was tweeting, and she, you know, she loves it. But not everybody's like that. But even she has a small team of people that she basically figured out, I need to have backup so that we can pull all this off and bring all the money ourselves directly. You know, has everybody heard of the Amanda Palmer stories? Yeah. Um, in a nutshell, she basically did a couple of different fundraising activities where one weekend she raised around $20,000 from auctioning off things that are in her house. She has this crazy kind of monsters house in the South End and then she also was doing tattoos that if you tweeted something, she would write it on her body and take a photo and send it to you. And she basically raised around $20,000 over the course of like a day and a half. And then she's done a bunch of other ones where she's basically um, figured out, oh, she did, she did a cover of Radiohead um, songs, an EP of Radiohead songs, which are actually really lovely. And she does a, a ukulele. And she, um, she did a lot of that fundraising for that and the recording of it and the promotion of it. She's done a lot of flash mobs where she's gone around the world and she'll tweet out and say, hey, I'm playing outside the Sydney Opera House in you know, an hour, come down. And she'll get a crowd of people there and she'll create this event around playing for free. And she's a street, she was a street performer in Boston, so she knows how to do it well. But she's a really interesting person to watch because obviously she's got her hand in all of it. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a little bit of a burnout factor. And I think it's funny that Joe Pernice doesn't necessarily like to do any of this stuff because it's a pretty common thing of like, I just don't want to be bothered with it. It's time consuming. Part of the reason it's time consuming is because the platforms are different. I was just, what yeah. you just said made me think of, every time I see a Twitter link that sends me to a Facebook page, I want to unfollow the person who did it. I mean, don't, they're not the same thing. You can't, don't connect them all because you don't really want the same thing going out at overall platforms. It's, it's not good. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in regards to content, I, and I, I work at the Greater Pittsburgh Works Council, we're a little concerned with this new copyright law called Order for the Works. Mm -hmm. And I've actually, a lot of our, my friends who are poets and musicians and film, we've been pulling our content off. It's considered orphan unless you supposedly register it with these clearing houses. And I don't know where that stands right now, but that has a lot of us up in the air about placing our videos, placing our photos online because sure. people go and take them and use them and it's considered an orphan work unless, even if, even if it's copywritten. Right. It's definitely so, a concern. I mean, I know in, in, in Massachusetts, a woman named Kathy Patetti from the Artist Foundation is working on this as well. And you're right. Um, the degree to which, I mean, I think any, any of us who are putting content online have kind of made the decision that so, so what, let them come and take yeah. it. I mean, Twitter's terms of service, they should be suing me for the book that we published that has the tweets that I wrote, the things that he said that we put out in a book. I mean, according to their terms of service, they have the rights to those. So it just depends on, but when you're talking about actual artwork, which I would argue that what we did isn't, um, <laughs> you know, it's definitely a, a bigger concern, and I would, I would certainly be careful. On Twitter, you said um, that Twitter is a different platform than Facebook. Yeah. Would you explain your, your ideas on that? Twitter, somebody <laughs> said it. I'm sure somebody famous has heard the quote a million times. But Twitter is the people that you that you want to know. Facebook is the people that you already know. The the thing that I find useful about Twitter is um, a lot of the people who are there are newsmakers and, and you know what they call tastemakers. Um, I've actually placed stories based on things that I've tweeted that some person in a newsroom somewhere <coughs> picked up. Um, it, it's very useful for finding out what those people are doing day to day, what an assignment desk, if, if you're talking about trying to do some press in a local area, what an assignment desk is looking for on a particular day um, is something that you'd be able to find out by following the Twitter feeds of the people who work the assignment desks at those TV stations. Sorry. Oh, so, so, you, so on your Twitter, the people you choose to follow, mm -hmm. you go to people in news organizations and how do you use your Twitter? I, I mean I'm I'm personally interested in music, politics, and news. So all of the all of the people that I follow tend to fall somewhere in that world. Um, but but if you're trying to influence newsmakers, they're all there. So 
follow them, kind of see what they're doing, see what they're interested in, talk to them, but do it in a very strategic way. Don't just, you know, don't just agree with them. That add something to the conversation. Um, you just kind of have to watch and listen for a while, and you'll eventually figure out what everybody's looking for and what everybody's doing there, and it can be very, very useful. And time consuming, but useful. So the one thing I always tell people that have not used Twitter is if you've not used a desktop application like TweetDeck, that Twitter doesn't really make any sense. They, they're in the midst of rolling out this new web interface, which I think is much ado about nothing. Did you get it? Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's better than what they had, but um, two years ago when Twitter was still building, I'd say to people, you know, download TweetDeck and it'll show you this column on the left is basically people that I'm following that are coming through in a tweet. This is people that mention me, my Twitter handle. These are people that I'm having direct message conversations with, and then you could do a search on something. And what I find fascinating about Twitter is you can actually track who out there is talking about different subjects. So I recently did a uh, Twitter 101 with Rick Berlin, who's a famed musician in Boston. It was interesting. He's still, he's still working out. And um, I basically said to him, what Twitter is, is it's like a public conversation that you can see who's talking about what, and you can follow them. So for someone like him, who his people who like you know Tom Waits or Randy Newman or I don't know you know that that ilk would really like his work, but he's on a small label in Boston, and certain people know him and love him, but he, his audience could be much bigger. I mean, you could follow and do searches on particular artists or places and start to actively follow those people, and then what happens is someone follows you, you're like, oh, who's that? And you click through and you'll see who they are, and sometimes you follow them back or you click through their link and you find out more about them. From a, from a marketer's standpoint, this is like, you know, amazing. Because the old model was you try to get something on in the newspaper and hope that the right people read it. Or that you put something on a TV commercial or a radio campaign, you hope the right people heard it, and then they came and bought your thing. Whereas with Twitter, you can actually see who is out there that's interested in the thing that I'm trying to promote and sell. I mean, that's amazing. So TweetDeck, which I've actually abandoned for um, Nambu, Nambu is another desktop application. There's a ton of them. If you go to um, Mashable.com, which is kind of a social media news site and, and gathering point now, um, but there's a lot of desktop applications that really transform Twitter from kind of the silly content into something that is actually really amazing. Sorry, one second. Sure. Um, oh, the one, the one thing that I, I use over the desktop applications, and it's for the sake of touring, because I never know what kind of computer I'm going to be at on, on the road, I use Hootsuite.com, it's a website-based version. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put a plug in for Mashable, has a fantastic PDF guide for anybody that's never used Twitter before. And they keep it very up to date, it explains how to use clients, yep. it explains how to follow people. Uh, I'll put a plug in for a friend's site too called CelebrityTweet.com if you want to start to kind of get a feel for them. He's broken it down by musicians and things like that. Um, last year I told people when I was here to follow Final Level, that's Ice-T. He was at 9,000 followers then, he's now I think right on the threshold of 60,000 followers. So um, just in a year's time. His is really I mean, Mashable should be on everybody's RSS feeds. Yeah. Just let me just add one thing to it, too. We just did a, a <laughs> competition with John Mayer on our stage, and they would say, what else can we get out of John Mayer? And I said, can he send, can he add a tweet with our URL in it, or at sign at our stage? And he did for one of the artists that was playing on the side stage that we had got the opportunity and they played. We had 5,000 unique visitors came from his twi tweet that he had, he had like a million and a half followers, so it's a ratio. But to get 5,000 people that didn't know about us click through to our site, that, that was stunning. You know, you have those kind of numbers. If somebody tweets something out, you have a very good chance of directing traffic. So um, Amanda Palmer is a great example of that. And Red, a lot Mil of Red Miller is another one. Red Miller. Oh, 97, yeah. Sorry. Could you have a question in the back first? Oh, the only thing I was going to say is I'm not new Twitter because they're adding rich meat into the stream now on the website. So front of beer and artists, that's huge. So you can put videos on the web and that's right. them, and hopefully potentially audio. Awesome. With, with the um, getting that many more followers on Twitter, what does that, how, what results has that measured in downloads and sales and all of that? Is what it, result? Yeah. Has it been? 
has a measure. I mean, it really depends on the artist. Ice T is in the process of obviously right now he's pursuing the acting career with SVU, but he's relaunched a label. He's in the process of uh, working on a documentary on the history of rap and more and more rap artists, etc., are coming in. And basically, if you just start following a couple of musicians. Look at who they are following and kind of click through and see some, some of who the people are. Sometimes you'll see a famous name and you go, oh yeah, I know that guy. But also check through and see, you'll see some smaller artists that are more interesting and things like that. I, I think it's not so much a, a numbers thing, so much as it's a qualitative thing. Uh, the best Twitterers that I've seen on there are exchanging all kinds of things. Hank Shockley is here. Uh, at Shockley is a fantastic account to follow. Because Hank keeps up with news, he keeps up with politics, he keeps up with music, he keeps up with science. I mean, his stuff is just amazing to read. You follow him just because he's an interesting guy. Yeah. If you treat it like a really interesting cocktail party, salon, <laughs> you know, give yourself 15, 20 minutes a day to just kind of check in and see what people are doing, you're going to find some really interesting stuff. And, and I know people that they get ideas from Twitter and they're doing things like they're developing web series or they're writing a book. They just, there's just interesting stuff that comes through your feed. It's, it's just something that you do because it's interesting to do, not necessarily, I wouldn't fixate it on it too much in terms of like, yeah, I'm going to sell a zillion records or I'm going to build you know, X number of people that are going to buy my merch. Well, it, it is, but it's also, I think, about the community aspect of it. It's why you want Google, Google Analytics on your site so you can actually right. see yeah, I think where are people coming from. When, when I was at Arts Boston, there was a very active group of folks in the arts world who were using Twitter. And on our site, I would be able to look and see the majority of referral traffic in the social media realm was coming from Twitter to our site, to Arts Boston. It wasn't coming from our partners that we had spent all this time wrangling. It wasn't coming from the old media. It was coming from Twitter. And you can't, you can't, you just can't brush it aside that Facebook and Twitter have that kind of power when you look at the numbers on a sheet. And, you know, it seems silly to a lot of people who are, who just don't get it, but it, it can have that kind of class. Plus, nowhere else will you see Ice T and Amy Man fighting. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. I'm just a segue off of what she said. Um, I'm not really into tweeting, but I have friends who are totally addicted to it or performing or whatever, and I have yet to see it translate into uh, support of live music into any kind of sales, merch. I mean, they they have hundreds and hundreds of hits, thousands. And I have yet to see it actually translate into, you know, uh, a co actual intimate connection with your fan. Everyone's more interested in being in, in the ether of the internet, but like to actually interact with your fan, it doesn't happen. Small numbers, but I will argue that um, we were able to sell out the world premiere of the opera Boston production of Madame White Snake using Twitter. I, 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 can, I can directly count, say, 50 tickets or so that were sold as a direct result. But um, White Snake's popular. No, 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 Madame White Snake, it's an opera. It's a brand new opera. Not White Snake, no time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm saying, and especially in relation to the, the world that you work in, which I think is similar to the one that I work in in Boston, that really helps. Because what happens is you have this landscape where traditional media is no longer reaching the same number of eyeballs that it used to reach. However, by pushing it out over Twitter feeds, we're enlarging the number of people that are seeing those things. So if there's a great Boston Globe preview that everybody missed the Sunday before because no one's reading print media anymore, um, we push it out over various Twitter feeds and people are seeing it that way and it's just, it kind of grows virally. And people are like, but you know, they used to say, like, okay, you send out 600 postcards, you get a 10% return on that. Oh, so two percent. Or, or, you were sorry, lucky. two percent or whatever. <laughs> what, is, what is the return on? I don't have a number for you right is now. There is, there any number? is there any kind of number? Is there any research for this? It depends. It depends on what sort of following you gain. Right. You see, lots of artists that have millions. Yeah, millions. That doesn't. I think you have to look at it a little differently. Look at it as. It, it, you know, 30 years ago when we were relying on print and terrestrial radio, even pre-cable television, there was a certain number of media outlets. You have to think of this as sort of a miniature media outlet. Media outlet. Yes. And like what happens in Boston is somebody from the ART tweets something, Joyce might retweet it, then somebody at Aqua Boston might retweet it, somebody at Emerson retweets it. Suddenly, you have spread through an audience that they may not be reading print media, but you've reached them through this sphere. and. The arts organizations, all they ever do is complain about they don't have young audience, they want young audience, but then they'll balk at this stuff. And it's like, well, you know, Twitter actually skews a little bit older, but Facebook skews a little younger. It's like, well, this is, if this is where they are, they go to where they are. Stop being annoyed that they're not coming to your thing because they don't know about you. So don't think of it as, I mean, who knows, email might 
go the way of the winds too in 10 years. Maybe nobody had email 15 years ago. Our arts organization uses it, so that's why I get to watch the lack of return. But, you know, I'm just trying to... But it depends on how actively you're using it. It's effective as it would be, too. I think you know? it's important that there needs to be a plan. If you're using it as a marketing tool, just like any other marketing, there has to be a plan behind it. They have and this is, the part that, this is the part that people miss, is that I think when you're just tweeting the thoughts of the day or something, that's not, you know, you, you're retweeting other people's tweets. This was successful. Your stuff was successful because... <coughs> You're including other people's name in it, and then you're retweeting other people's right. tweets. I have 30 followers, and I haven't typed. I haven't even stopped to do that. No way. All I'm doing is practice, practicing, because I've been against the whole tweeting thing. And I got to know about it, because that's what I do. And um, so I was practicing. I made a blog, and, and I'm just watching what everybody's doing. And I'm following NPR and Bob Lefsetz and you know, all these people that are doing music stuff as well as other things. Post and everything I'm interested in. So it's kind of like my daily headlines now that I like to read, but in the same way, though, I realized that I started tweeting and retweeting based on observing what everybody else was doing, including those people. And I got all those people are following me now. I didn't even ask. Right. Right? I didn't have to reach out to anybody. I've done nothing. I've done no free downloads. I've got offered tickets. I have a link to my blog. And hopefully they read it and liked it, and that's why they're right. following me. But well, well, Ariel actually always says, "Don't you don't have to use all of these things. Use the things that feel natural and comfortable to you." And I think that's good guidance because you may not, you might find that LinkedIn is a much better platform for you and what you're doing, and using the thread of discussions and groups and all the rest. Or you may find that MySpace is still really effective. I mean, it's hard. It, 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 it's not one size fits all. I don't yeah, think. If it, 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 it like redone a MySpace page. Yeah. Twitter is such a, a new and creative thing, and it's so instant. Like I, I check my, my Twitter feed like every 30 minutes, and so I'll constantly know what, what's going on. But I had friends who did a flash mob thing in New York recently, where they tweeted, we're going to be in Union Square in 30 minutes, let's have a jam session, bring your instrument. And so I took, took the bus there, I got there, there was probably like 40, 50 kids there, and this is on one tweet. And um, and like you know, if you have a backpack full of CDs, it's, it's one of those things that's hard to measure exactly what the impact is, but now these 40 kids, even whether if they bought the CD or not, I guarantee you they went home and they're like, yo, I was hanging with my friend JR the other day, and, like, uh, and, and it's something that really engages a fan to, to a level where they're like, they feel like they're part of it. Yeah. Um, I was with this kid, and he tweeted in New York, uh, I'm at this building, and two kids drove out from Ohio to see him at that building. Wow. So it's one of those things where, and then the big thing with Twitter too is you need to be diverse. Like, you don't just tweet links to your music. Tweet things that make people enjoy. The other day I tweeted out something I'm scared of losing, my socks in the dryer. And like, and that's not something to do with my music, but like 50 people retweeted it and now I have new followers. And it, it's not all about me and me. It's are you communicating to fans? Are you giving them something to attach to you? And then at the end of all this, they're going to want to support you as an artist. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, you asked that question, I just thought the last night, I'm following uh, Levesey, I don't know if you ever heard of the uh, R&B singer. And uh, at her concert, they pretty much sold out most of the tickets. But then, uh, almost right before the concert, they opened up another session, and she tweeted, she tweeted, you know, if you left me because, you know, tickets right now, you know, come back, they opened up a new section. And, uh, and I got, like, the first five, I'm giving away, like, the first five tickets. Wow. And, like, that whole section filled up, like, right before the concert started. That's great. So, you know, Another sort of effective way to use Twitter, um, and you know, I've 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 been using it for probably about two years now. But and and uh, through my music account, I only have maybe four or five hundred uh, followers. Um, you know, whereas I'm following twelve hundred because I'm trying to really bring in a lot of information. So um, I play a lot of coffee shops around town. Um, I'll book a show at that coffee shop, and I always keep tabs of whether or not the venues that I'm playing at are are active on Twitter. And a lot of them, like you know, this coffee shop, Baked and Wired. I mean, they're part of the whole cupcake coffee scene that's going around here in D.C. They have like 12, 1,200 followers who are very active in what they say. So leading up into my show and, and afterwards, I asked, please tweet out, you know, that I'm playing with a link to free music. And that music link, I've gone through Bitly, which is a unique, you know, URL creator. So I can go back, and after they have tweeted this out, I can go back into Bitly and see, oh, I've seen that 15 to 20 people have downloaded. The free EP. So 
15 to 20, I mean, I'm not going to sell that many CDs at the show, maybe two people buy the show, but I've got that many more people listening to my music now, potentially. And if you do that with every show over the course of, you know, six or seven months, like you can really get your music out there in a lot of different ways. I think we have one last question. Well, um, I think I want to comment on the Tom 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 Um, I think direct mail is just a much easier thing to measure. And email too, where you, know, you can go into your report and see how many people are open and how many people are collected. I'm going to write some too. And Twitter and Facebook is much more about who you're influencing and it's the people who follow you and who you interact with are influencing as well. And there actually are sites that will measure this for you and give you numbers. And one I like a lot is cloud.com, K L O U T. Right. And um, so you can walk in there and see what your influence number is. They have a, you know, point themselves with who you influence and who you're influenced by and who those people are following. And then if you want to get really smart, you can reach out to those people who are your biggest influencers and give them specific messages. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Virgin did a really great promotion with their, they opened the line to Toronto and gave the top 20 influencers free tickets. And then they tweeted out, you know, if you retweet this, you get 50%. Black and they had the biggest growth, the best growth in day of the year doing that. But I think with Twitter, it's not just like, I have 10,000 followers, but who are these followers and how can I best use them and how can I create messages that are going to tell them specifically to that? And so it just takes a bit more strategy than, you know, the sending postcards. That's right. Um, two last comments, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, I actually interviewed Ariel Hyatt and it's on my website, but let's do it, this music podcast that I do. If you go to wellrunnerradio.net slash Ariel Publicity, it'll take you to this page. And um, I actually created a, a group for this last night because I was trading emails with Lucy, um, who handles the Twitter feed for future music. And I don't think they had it, so I created it. So. If anybody is tweeting, send me a message or tweet something to me and I'll add you to the list. It's basically everyone who's speaking at this event, which is a great way if you want to follow all of them at once to use this if you have a Twitter account. And last thought, if you are tweeting, the hashtag for the event is uh, FMC10. And if you don't know what that means, uh, download TweetDeck <laughs> and put in a search term for FMC10 and you'll start to see a thread of everybody here that's tweeting that are using this tag and you'll start to see sort of a running conversation and actually during all the panels while people are on stage talking there'll be another conversation happening in the audience with people on their laptops so it's an interesting way to kind of get uh, a secondary conversation so thank you everybody for coming and staying and sorry Ariel is not here but we hope this was helpful thanks <laughs>